Welcome to the deep dive. Today we're digging into something pretty remarkable, actually. Oh, yeah. It's this 150-year-old chart hand-drawn by a farmer in Ohio, believe it or not. A farmer? Seriously? Yeah. And somehow it's got this whole new life today. You see it, like, everywhere in finance circles, online, on social media, investor forums. Huh. What's it supposed to do? Well, it promises this kind of order, you know? In markets that often feel totally chaotic, it's supposed to predict the ups and downs. Ah, okay. I think I know the one you mean. Samuel Benner's cycle chart, right, from <laughs> like 1875. That's the one. And it's got this enduring allure, especially now after all the crashes we've seen, the dot-com bubble, 2008, even COVID in 2020. Yeah, I get that. People crave certainty, right? And Benner's chart offers this, well, this simple roadmap, a calendar of boom and bust. Oh. Modern finance feels so much more probabilistic uncertain. Exactly. That desire for certainty is powerful. So our mission in this deep dive is to give you, our listener, a real shortcut to understanding this whole thing. We want to get past the hype. Okay. How are we going to tackle it? Three things. First, we're going to really deconstruct Benner's original method. Like, what was he actually thinking? Right. Get inside his head. Second, we'll test it rigorously. See if those predictions actually hold up against modern data. The empirical test. Crucial. And third, we'll try to build a kind of Benner 2.0, keep the spirit, but update it for, you know, the 21st century. Okay. Sounds like a plan. So by the end, you should have a really clear picture of Benner's ideas, how they actually did, and maybe even some insights into market psychology that are still relevant today. Exactly. Okay, so let's start with the man himself, Samuel Benner. He wasn't your typical Wall Street guy, right? No, not at all. He was born in 1832, an Ohioan farmer, also managed in ironworks. Pretty successful, actually, until disaster struck. Disaster? Yeah. What happened? Well, he got wiped out financially by the Panic of 1873. That was a huge depression back then. And uh, to make things worse, hog cholera killed his livestock. Just devastating. Wow. Okay, so this wasn't just some theory for him. It was personal. Deeply personal. His goal was super practical. Created tools so farmers and merchants wouldn't get ruined like he did. He wanted them to know what years to make money on pig iron, hogs, corn, and provisions. So he dedicated himself to figuring this out. Yeah, in his uh, early retirement, he researched like crazy, and it led to his book, Benner's Prophecies of Future Ups and Downs in Prices, in 1875. And people actually read it. Oh, yeah. It went through 16 editions by 1907. Apparently, you'd find it on bankers' desks. It was a big deal. So how did he come up with these prophecies? Was it based on data? Absolutely. Right. Purely empirical for his time. He crunched historical price data for key commodities. He famously said, the iron trade is the barometer of the general trade of the country. Pig iron was his main indicator, then. It was. He saw it as the leading indicator. And from that, he identified this 27-year uh, super cycle in pig iron prices with two distinct patterns inside it. Okay, tell me about those patterns, the 27-year cycle. All right, so for price peaks, they called good times, the time to sell. You saw a sequence, eight years, then nine years, then 10 years. Let uh, seven. Oh. Exactly. And for the price troughs, the hard times, it was a different sequence. 11 years, then nine years, then seven years. Uh -huh. Also adds up to- 27, huh? That's neat, like a rhythm. A very specific rhythm. But he also had a longer cycle, didn't he, for the big crashes? He did, yeah, the panic cycle. He called it a revolution, actually, a 54-year pattern for major financial crises. 54 years, how did that work? He said it took panics 54 years to kind of cycle through. It went a, a major panic, then another one 16 years later, then 18 years after that, then 20 years after that. Let me add that up, 16, 18, 20. Yep, 54. Right. And he pegged this to the big 19th century panics he knew, 1819, 1837, 1857, and the one that got him, 1873. It's quite intricate. But then he tied it all back to nature, yeah. sunspots. That part seems a bit odd now. It does, yeah. But it was central to his thinking. He noticed an 11-year cycle in corn and hog prices, peaks alternating every five and six years. And that matched the sunspot cycle. Roughly, yeah, the 11-year solar cycle. So his theory was sunspots affect weather, weather affects crops, crops affect prices, prices ripple through the economy, hitting pig iron, causing the big cycles. Wow, a whole chain reaction starting from the sun. It seems far-fetched now, sure. but, you know, it wasn't totally fringe back then. Big names like William Stanley Jevons were also exploring sunspot links to the economy. Right, but the key point for us today is that original logic doesn't really apply anymore, does it? Not really, no. <laughs> the economy has fundamentally transformed since 1875. Pig iron definitely isn't the barometer anymore. We're driven by tech, services, finance. Exactly. And agriculture, while still vital, doesn't dominate the economy in the same way. Tech, 
global supply chains, hedging. Yeah. They insulate things more. Plus, the whole money system change. No more gold standard. We have the Fed. That's probably the biggest piece. Benner lived under the gold standard. Panics were often liquidity crises. The Fed, active monetary policy, it turned panics into more managed recessions, usually. So if the chart seems to work today, it can't be because of Benner's original reason, pig iron crops, mm -hmm. sunspots, that link is broken. Precisely. That's the key insight. If there's any alignment now, it suggests maybe it's tapping into something else, something more timeless. Like human psychology, crowd behavior. Potentially. Like the rhythm of collective human sentiment. That's something that might persist even when the economic structure changes. Okay, so we've picked apart the original theory. Now for the big test. Does it actually work? How did we check its predictions against, you know, the last century of data? Right. Got to move past the anecdotes. We ran a quantitative evaluation from 1924 to 2024, basically the modern part of the chart people share. And what data did you use? We used the S&P 500 index for the market. Official NBER recession dates for all well, recessions and the VIX, the fear gauge for periods of extreme panic, especially after 1990 when VIX data starts. OK, so first up, the panic cycle. Did Benner predict the big downturns? Well, the results were kind of mixed, but definitely interesting. We defined a hit pretty generously. An NBER recession starting within 12 months, either side of the predicted year or a big VIX spike. And... Any hits. Yeah, some. It flied the general timing around the end of World War II, like 1945, and the recession Volcker caused in 1981. Those lined up reasonably well. But it wasn't perfect. What about those near misses people talk about? Right, those are important. A big one is 1927. Benner predicted panic. The Great Depression crash wasn't until late 29, but that's only, what, 20 months off? Close enough for some people to count it. Maybe. Exactly. And then there's 2019. Benner predicted panic. The COVID crash hit in Feb. 2020, just two months later, VIX went absolutely crazy over 82. Okay, I can see why proponents point to that one. It's pretty close. Very close. But then you have the clear misses. Like what? Like 1965. Mm -hmm. He predicted panic. The economy was actually booming. Or 1999. That wasn't panic. That was peak.com usoria. Right. The crash came later. Although, yeah. wasn't there some VIX spike around then? There was, late 98. But oh. that was tied to the LTCM hedge fund collapse. Different event, really. Not the dot-com bust itself. So yeah, mixed results for the panic cycle. Okay, what about the buy and sell signals? The good times to sell, hard times to buy. That's the practical part people focus on, right? Absolutely. This is where we really put it to the test. We simulated a portfolio starting back in 1924. That'll work. Simple rules. Sell everything on day one of a good times year, hold cash, earning zero, then buy back in on day one of a hard times year. Strict better timing. And you compared that to just buying and holding the S&P 500. Exactly. Buy and hold over the same 100-year period. Okay, drum roll. How did the Benner timing strategy do? Uh, well, it wasn't pretty. It dramatically underperformed buy and hold, like not even close. Really? How bad? Okay, so the compound annual growth rate, CAGR, better timing got 5.8%. Buy and hold got 9.9%. Oof. That difference compounds massively over 100 years, doesn't it? Hugely. If you start it with $100, the Benner strategy ends up around $14,000, maybe $14,350. Buy and hold. Over $845,000. Wow. That is stark. So why isn't this more widely known? People still swear by the chart. That's the million dollar question, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, to be fair, the Benner strategy did have a slightly smaller, worse drawdown. It got you out in 2007 before the 08 crash. That felt good, I'm sure. Right. It kept you in cash all the way until 2012. You missed the huge initial recovery rally from the 2009 bottom. That hurt returns massively in the long run. So it confirms the old saying, time in the market beats time in the market. Pretty much, yeah. yeah. The academic consensus is really strong on that. Market timing is just incredibly hard to do consistently. Okay, so the numbers just don't support the hype around its accuracy. Why do people still see hits? What's going on psychologically? Great question. It really boils down to some powerful psychological biases. Hmm. First, the predictions are for entire years. That's a huge target window. Very forgiving, yeah. And the labels themselves, panic, Good times, hard times, they're vague, right? Mm -hmm. Qualitative. They allow for a lot of wiggle room and in interpretation after the fact. Ex post rationalization. Ah, I see. So if a crash happens in February 2020, you can say the 2019 panic prediction was basically right. Exactly. Or a recession in late 1980 counts for a 1981 prediction. This flexibility feeds right into confirmation bias. Where you focus on the times it seemed right and ignore or explain away the misses. Precisely. You praise the 2007 sell, 
but forget the buy in 96 missed the biggest part of the dot-com mania when you test it systematically like we did you take away that wiggle room and the flaws become obvious so fascinating history maybe captures something intuitively but not a reliable trading tool today that sums it up pretty well okay so the original model based on pig iron and sunspots tested poorly but you mentioned the idea of a simple visual guide still resonates how do we build on that this is the benner 2.0 part right yeah this is where it gets really interesting i think the key insight is to reframe Benner. Think of him not as a failed economic forecaster, but maybe as an unwitting behavioral economist. Behavioral economist? How so? Look at his labels again. Good times, sell. Panic, hard times, buy. Those aren't really economic terms in a modern sense. They are fundamentally behavioral or emotional states, aren't they? Huh, okay. Like mapping the market's mood. Exactly. Think about that classic Wall Street cheat sheet diagram that shows the cycle of market emotions. Oh, yeah. The one that goes from disbelief up to euphoria, then down through anxiety, denial, panic, capitulation, depression. That's the one. Now, map Benner's terms onto it, his good times when he says sell. That lines up almost perfectly with thrill and euphoria. Selling then is smart, but hard because of FOMO. Right. Everyone's greedy. His panic that's obviously panic and capitulation on the chart, driven purely by fear. Makes sense. And it's hard times when he says buy. That mirrors depression and disbelief. Buying then is usually the right financial move long term, but feels awful because everyone's so pessimistic. Wow, that connection is actually quite compelling. So maybe the cycles he observed were really just symptoms of these waves of human emotion. That's the big idea. He stumbled onto the psychological rhythm of markets. And that gives us a solid theoretical basis for a Benner 2.0, something that directly measures these underlying psychological and, importantly, valuation states. Okay, so Benner 2.0 wouldn't be deterministic like the old chart. It would be probabilistic using modern data. Exactly. No more fixed calendar dates. Instead, we integrate multiple data sources to identify the prevailing market regime. What kind of sources? Three main pillars. First, valuation. We need a long-term anchor. The best tool here is the Schiller PE, or Cape E ratio, cyclically adjusted price to earnings. Why that one specifically? Because it smooths out short-term earnings noise by averaging over 10 years. High Cape historically predicts lower long-term returns, low Cape predicts higher ones. It tells you if the market is generally cheap or expensive relative to history. Okay, valuation anchor, pillar two. Volatility. We need a real-time fear gauge. That's the VIX. Spikes in the VIX clearly signal the kind of panic regime Benner was trying to capture. It measures expected short-term choppiness. Got it. Valuation, volatility, the stuff that has to be sentiment. You got it. Sentiment. We need to capture that collective belief, the euphoria or despair, that isn't always justified by fundamentals. How do we measure that? We can use proxies. Things like the AAII Investor Sentiment Survey that tracks bullish versus bearish individual investors, mm. or even uh, Google Trends for searches like Stock Market Bubble or Buy Stocks. Spikes there can show waves of speculation or fear. Okay, so KP for valuation, VIX for volatility, AAII or Google Trends for sentiment. How do we combine these into a better 2.0 dashboard? What are the regimes? Right, this isn't about precise timing, remember. It's a strategic framework to understand the environment. We define four regimes based on where these indicators fall relative to their historical ranges. Makes sense. Walk me through them. Regime one. Regime one. Overheated. Think distribution phase. This is high risk, but potentially lower future returns. You'd see a very high Schiller PE, maybe above the 90th percentile historically, a low complacent VIX, maybe below 20, and euphoric sentiment, like a high AAII bull bear spread. Psychologically, this is Benner's good times. Thrill and euphoria. Exactly. Time for caution. Maybe trimming risky positions. Then what? Regime two. Regime two. Contraction. The panic or markdown phase. Extreme risk. Prices falling fast. Valuation starts coming down. The VIX spikes high, think 30, 40, or even higher. And sentiment goes into freefall, from denial to panic. That's Benner's panic phase. Anxiety, denial, panic on the cheat sheet. Focus is on not losing everything. Precisely. Capital preservation is key. Okay, after the storm, regime three. Regime three, undervalued, the accumulation phase. This is where potential long-term returns are highest, but sentiment is awful. <laughs> Schiller PE is low, maybe bottom quartile. VIX is often still elevated, but maybe starting to calm down. Sentiment is deeply pessimistic, negative AAII spread. So Benner's hard times, capitulation, anger, depression. 
Buying feels terrible, but is probably smart. That's a classic contrarian opportunity, yeah. Accumulating assets when they're cheap. And finally, the turn. Regime 4. Regime 4. Recovery. The markup phase. Things are improving. Fundamentals look better. Sentiment starts shifting. Valuation rises from its lows, but is still maybe below average. VIX normalizes. Sentiment moves from disbelief towards hope and optimism. The start of the next bull run. Disbelief and hope on the cheat sheet. That's the one. A more favorable environment for investing again. I can totally picture this. You could even visualize it like Benner's chart, maybe a long-term S&P chart, but with the background color-coded based on the current regime. Red for overheated, gray for contraction, green for undervalued. Exactly. A dynamic, data-driven dashboard that honors the spirit of Benner's visual guide, but uses robust, modern inputs. It tells you the character of the market environment. That's a much more useful tool than just hoping a 150-year-old calendar is right. That's the goal, transforming a historical curiosity into something potentially actionable or at least informative. Okay, so let's wrap this up for everyone listening. What are the key takeaways? The original Benner cycle. Fascinating history, right? But as a predictive tool today. Yeah, demonstrably flawed. The original reasons, pig iron crops are obsolete. And our testing showed it just doesn't perform well compared to simple buy and hold. Its popularity seems more about psychology, confirmation bias, the appeal of certainty. Right, but the Benner 2.0 idea reframes it. It sees Benner as accidentally tapping into market psychology. Exactly. And this modern framework uses real data valuation like KP, volatility like VIX, and sentiment measures to give you a probabilistic sense of the market regime. Are we overheated, contracting, undervalued, or recovering? It helps you understand the psychological tide. It's about understanding the rhyme of the market, not predicting exact dates. Okay, here's a final kind of mind-bending thought for you, the listener, to chew on. Oh, go on. Think about that concept from economics, sunspot equilibrium. Benner thought sunspots caused cycles. That was wrong, scientifically. But what if the Benner chart itself acts like a sunspot today? Wait, what do you mean? Like the chart itself influences things? Yeah, it has no real predictive power. We established that. But what if... Enough people believe it does. The chart predicts, say, 2026 is a good time to sell. If millions of investors see that, believe it and plan to sell in 2026 because the chart says so. Mm. Could their collective action actually create the market peak the chart predicted? Independent of fundamentals, whoa. Right. The prophecy becomes self-fulfilling purely through collective belief coordinated by this old chart. That's actually a really profound point. It makes you question how much of market movement is real economic forces and how much is just story and belief driving behavior. Exactly. So how much is reality? How much is belief? That feels like a fitting, maybe ironic legacy for Samuel Benner. His flawed 19th century theory finding this weird new relevance as a potential behavioral coordination device, a sunspot, in our totally interconnected 21st century markets. Something to think about.